Welcome to Tip Top, growing up your business with Metronomics. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, and stories on how you can grow up your company at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. I am your host, Jed Roberts. And today our topic is hiring, coaching, and evaluation to build A players. Today I'm with Rob Monson. Rob's based in Utah. And Rob and I have been scaling up coaches and now metronomics coaches for quite some time. Good to see you, Rob. Good to see you, Jed. Thanks for having me today. I'm looking forward to it. This is a really, really complex and intricate topic. Uh, and I know that you're one of the experts here, so I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Now, as always, any topic that involves people gets tricky. So I'm looking forward to seeing your expertise. So, so Rob, yeah. you, you go you go way, way back, um, sort of pretty much the same as me. I joined Scaling Up in 2016. I think you were just after. Tell me a little bit about your uh, your journey, first as a Scaling Up coach and now, now as a metronomics coach. So, you know, it was interesting back in, so I grew up in Utah, but I was shipped to Florida as part of a merger back in the year 2000 and uh, stayed with a company that I was with for a few years, but then uh, went to a company called Compass Knowledge Group that was in Orlando, Florida, um, that now is part of Pearson Learning years later. But what we did is help big universities take degree programs online. And we were using both the Rockefeller Habits and Top Grading to grow the organization. And, you know, what I found was sort of daily bliss uh, in the sense that uh, it was an organization that was largely free of politics. Uh, it was free of dumb decisions. Uh, and we focused, we had, we had an A player team around us all the time because we hired so consistently and so rigorously that it sort of became one of the best days of my life at work on a daily basis. And um, I was, it's funny because wherever I went thereafter, I would try to re-implement these systems again. So uh, I left Compass four years later and it's funny because I ended up going to a place called Golf Channel, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. And it's funny because I'm not a golfer, uh, never have been. And I, I do love sports, love football and basketball. And uh, that was enough to get me in the door there. I became their first director of search engine optimization. And I talk about Golf Channel in a loving way uh, because I had such fun when I was there in so many ways. But it was not Compass in the sense that it was sort of, you know, could be ruled and driven by politics in a lot of ways. Uh, we had some A players, but we also had some toxic A players or what we call the B slash C, someone that, you know, they, they are uh, being productive, but they don't live our core values. And they didn't have 100% A player leadership team, for sure, looking back. And that was a lot to overcome, a lot of inertia to overcome. And I was fortunate to, uh, you know, gain enough credibility through the work that I did there that by year three, they were letting me install some of the tools. We always use top grading and uh, were fortunately able to implement a lot of the tools like the daily huddle, the daily huddle and the weekly meeting and a lot of the Rockefeller framework that uh, then became sort of well known inside of golf now, even after I left um, and th three years later. So it was a sort of an exciting time to see all the effect that those tools had. And golfnow.com, which is one of the tools that Golf Channel purchased, golfnow.com is the world's largest online tea time discounter. Uh, we were able to take that from about 8 million to about 50 million, I believe, in that period of time. And a lot of that was uh, some getting through some inertia up front and some pain. But then uh, the marketing department very closely following the Rockefeller habits. And later on, it was everybody else following it. So, um, and they always wondered why our team was so much better than everybody else's. And that's because we, we were uh, top grading rig rigorously through that team. So, so you went from your first company, um, Compass, which you said was, you know, best day of your life every day, to another company where it was still good, but it wasn't quite as harmonious. So, so you saw firsthand uh, the differences in two different environments in business. Uh, was that really what took you down that path of looking at, you know, what the difference was and why, why some companies were nicer to work in than others? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, what I kept finding was that, um, as my career progressed, what I would try to do is sort of install the same systems and processes because I was trying to get back to the same sort of setup that I had at Compass, where, um, you know, I knew what to expect. We didn't have chaos running around, but we had an A player team and we just weren't governed by daily stupid decisions or behaviors that were inconsistent with the core values. And what a difference in everyone's life that makes when that can be, when that can be the case. So, um, you know, I was in, so I, 
tell people I was in the marketing function for years. I was head of marketing at uh, uh, head of online marketing at Golf Channel. I was in the marketing function at Compass and marketing after that. And that had kind of been me for 20 years was a senior leadership in the marketing or, you know, moving up to senior leadership in the marketing function. Um, but over time, what I found was that uh, marketing can be a very exasperating job. And no matter how good you're at, you're at you, you are at marketing, um, there's always so much opinion and so much questioning that goes into it that the best marketers in the world are under constant scrutiny. So the data shows that about 80% of CEOs are dissatisfied with their head of marketing, whereas only about 10 to 20% are dissatisfied with the CIO, for instance. So over time, this led me to a path to believe that, you know, what I really wanted to do was to help people, help the CEO in a different way and maybe do it in a different way than I was able to do internally. But as a coach, be able to share these best practices and these tools um, to help them become something like what I had approximated and seen at Compass to be able to draw, to be able to grow profitably with less drama, with no drama um, and faster. And you, you mentioned a couple of terms that not everyone would be familiar with and maybe not everyone would be familiar with. So, so the, the, the concept that the book top grading and also the concept of A players. Do you want to take us through through those? Yeah. So top grading is a structured interview process. And my what I always say about top grading is it's the greatest business process in the world. Yes, worst book in the world. So and sorry, Brad Smart, if you ever watch this, please don't hate me. Um, I love the top grading, I love the top grading philosophy and in the interview process. Uh, it's just a brutal book to read through. There's a lot of challenges around top grading the book. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll tend to take, and I, you, I, maybe you do this as well. I tend to take my clients through, um, a version of that, that I've sort of built out, um, from the methodology that I learned at Compass and beyond that follows that more closely in a condensed format rather than a book. But what top grading tells us is that Brad Smart's research was impeccable and his research back in the day, and this was for GE who, you know, this became top, uh, the, the research Brad Smart did became the hiring standard for General Electric back when Jack Welch was there. One of their differentiators was hiring a talent. And your GE has since fallen off and probably because they don't use top grading as much anymore. But what's interesting is uh, you take a process like top grading and you go from, so, you know, think about this just for a second, because it's, it's a fascinating way to look at an organization. Uh, most organizations, and I do see this across my clients, particularly we do our first talent assessment. Most organizations only have about 25% A players. And what an A player is, is by definition, it is someone who consistently lives the core values and who consistently hits KPI driven goal. That's an A player. We uh, organizations only have about 25% on average. And the, one of the, one of the craziest things that we as CEOs tell ourselves is that that's okay. That all the problems that are churned up on a day-to-day -day basis by having B players and C players are okay. So what happens is you get in these organizations and the decision tree is awful. It is based on things that they have learned from other companies using horrible best practices that have adopted to live with only 25% A players. So think about it this way. Those 25%, those A players are dragging the rest of the organization with them. They're dragging the other 75% with them. That is unfair to them. Um, and that is actually unfair to the B and C players as well. And it's unfair to the, it's unfair to the, to the daily life that everyone can have if they have an A player organization. So what we try to do is put in place a process with top grading that gets us to 50 plus percent A players within the first year. And I'm happy to say that a lot of my clients scale up into the 60, 70, even 80% range. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because top grading can be up to 90% effective, but you know, you'll always have room for a couple of your really high performing Bs in there, but you can get fairly high on the A player scale if you put a little bit of effort behind it. Why do CEOs tolerate that? What, what have you found? What, what reasons they don't know do they better. give you? They okay. just a lack of knowledge. That's really interesting because I, I interviewed uh, Glenn um, Dahl, um, when, you know, one of our uh, fellow Metro yeah. Wellness coaches a, a while back, Love Glenn. and and that was on the um, that was on the topic of his CEO doom loop, uh, and one of the findings in in that white paper, the, the the one he produced with a few other coaches, was that CEOs have pretty much given up dealing with people problems because they just don't know how to anymore. Uh, and if they've given yeah. up, then they're tolerating. And if you're tolerating something, you get what you tolerate. Uh, you get what you tolerate, 100%. Yeah. But there's I, a better I, way. There's absolutely a better way. There is. And we'll, and, we'll, and so what's interesting, first and foremost, and I, it's funny because I just got off a prospect call with a CEO uh, not too long ago. And he was telling me, you know, oh, this would be great to have coaching because I'd finally learn how to be a CEO. And I said, well, here's the good news. Nobody knows how to be a CEO. And I was telling about, I have clients that are, that have been Harvard educated, 
that you know weren't uh, up to speed on everything they run their company, and they now are because they now know what the best practices are to run a business. And I always think to this day, it's fascinating that all of us coaches don't become CEOs because we have the most knowledge of what works and do- doesn't work across the suite of our clients. It's the absolute best proving ground for that. But if we come into this uh, to this idea that you know uh, CEOs just don't know and understand the systems and processes that are required to grow A players, that is consistent. They, they're th- so here are the things that most don't understand. They don't understand how to hire. They don't understand how to coach consistently. And they don't understand how to evaluate talent consistently. And I would actually say that's true of just about every manager, not just the CEO, but most people do not know those three things. And that's what makes the get you, the you get what you tolerate scenario a reality. So, you know, what we want to do is we want to put in place a system or multiple systems in this case that one, allow us to hire consistently at the very highest end of the spectrum. We'd rather hire, we'd rather have one great performer, one A player, than three average performers. And we would rather pay that one great person up to two times their salary and we'll still be winning. That's called one equals three hiring. The container stores use that for years and it's a, it's a, it's a way to win. Um, and that is really top grading in a nutshell. We want to get that in place. We want to get a consistent weekly one-on-one coaching program. And that's fascinating because I've actually seen LinkedIn posts recently where uh, coaches from other organizations were uh, not, not necessarily disparaging, but a little bit. They were disparaging and uh, talking about the, the lack of necessity for one-on-one coaching. And I find that to be a fascinating observation that isn't true because you can actually take two companies and compare those that do one-on-one coaching and those that those that do it and those that don't. And the ones that do consistent weekly one-on-one coaching will grow so much faster. We'll have such happier team members and we'll be able to get to their goals a lot quicker than those that don't. So what does one-on-one coaching look like? So one-on-one coaching, this is, I, I give credit, I go back to Compass Knowledge Group uh, for my one-on-one coaching format. So a good one-on-one coaching format is, uh, it's a once a week meeting between supervisor and direct report. And now before I get too deep into this, what's really interesting is I get some immediate pushback on this, usually because someone will say, well, we want to be a flat organization. And so we have more than 10 direct reports going to one person. Great. Okay. So either one of two things is usually happening. One, no one's getting coached in that scenario. No one's improving or getting better. Or two, if the, if the somehow that leader is attempting to coach more than 10 people, that leader's mental health is deteriorating rapidly. Their uh, anxiety is through the roof. Their insomnia is through the roof. Uh, almost without fail, every single time. And what you can do, and what, what organizations don't realize, is that coaching is not just—it's not a title that you give to someone; it's an activity that you give to someone. So you can you can appoint more than one coach in your organization as an assignment, and no increase in pay has to come with that. As a matter of fact, there are ways to free up people's time to be able to coach effectively. So you can appoint multiple coaches in an organization to be able to handle the burden of coaching someone in a one-on-one. Um, on a weekly basis. But what we find in the weekly one-on-one is that's an opportunity to become better. And that opportunity, a couple of things, opportunity to become better, both as a coach and as the talent who's being coached. It's an opportunity to get fully aligned. And it's the opportunity to have the great debate that must occur every week between supervisor and direct report. There's so much going on in our businesses that we have to have a great debate about what must be done and what must not be done in the next week to make sure that we can get uh, we can either accomplish our priority and KPI goals or get back on pace to accomplish them. So the structured one-on-one, what it does, it does a few things. One, it builds rapport. So we want to make sure that we spend a few minutes getting to know each other with personal and professional good news. Two, it does a very uh, impactful deep dive on where we are on priorities and KPIs with the coach asking very helpful how and what questions to be able to get the talent, to be able to get their own breakthroughs and get to the next level of knowing how they can um uh, succeed with their priorities and KPIs. And then beyond that, uh, what happens is there is some behavior work that takes place throughout that meeting, particularly not just in the aligning on priorities and time management, but it is also looking at the behaviors of that person. What I mean by behaviors is how consistent are they living the core values, the talent. And what we want to do in that meeting is work with the talent to see, hey, how are we doing? Where do you need the most help? How can we support you to be able to help live this core value more effectively or this core value more effectively? So you're, you're actually measuring al- alignment to specific core values. H- how do you do that? Well, so when we talk about alignment to core values, there's a process that takes place throughout my organizations. And one of the things that we do is we, when we evaluate talent, we grade everyone on each core value in the organization. Grade them on a scale of one to 10, 
all the way from never lose the core value at a one up to a 10, they're, they're ex exceptional or exemplify the core value. And that's a norming process. So it's a subjective ranking, but it's a norming process based on what the leadership team sees. And what that allows us to do is to understand very specifically where someone needs help. So what we find in about 75 to 80% of the instances is that someone who's struggling to hit their KPI goals is also struggling with core values. And that makes sense. Core values are behavioral. Typically, we're off in terms of our habit, our routine, the way we treat others. Those are the things that typically hold us back. And those have to be worked on um, in the one-on-one -on -one setting where we're asking someone, how are you improving living this core value? Where do you need the most help and support? Right? What specifically have you done in the last week to get better at becoming more aligned with the organization's expectation of you living this core value? And those can sound, you know, it sounds like a negative conversation. That's actually a very positive conversation that takes place in a lot of cases. Right. It's, hey, we want to be able to just get more and more aligned with the right kind of behavior. So if you read a lot of Jim Collins, you know, you've heard Jim Collins and his mentor, Bill Lazier, say, hey, uh, you know, uh, finance and, and sales are actually easy. Living values, that's what's hard. And that is correct, because what we're trying to do with values is shape consistently an outcome that we expect to happen on a day to day basis down to the employee level. And if we can get that to occur on the values end, all the other stuff that we have to do in the organization becomes that much easier. If you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit that bell to get notified of the next episodes as they come out. We go through and evaluate each team member by each core value in the organization on a scale of one to 10. So how, you know, how consistent are they at living this core value versus the next core value? Um, all the way from, you know, never lives it all the way up to exemplifies it. And, uh, from that, let's say you have three or four core values that your organization lives by. Uh, great. That will give you sort of an average score across all those core values. And that will be taken and compared to your productivity score. And productivity score is designed to be um, a very objective scoring criteria. And that is that it is you know, how often you hit KPI driven goal. And yes, there are instances where people, you know, we don't have KPIs in place. So we have to judge it as best we can. But combining those two things, gives us what, you know, gives us a grade and people are sometimes uncomfortable with the idea of grading other people, but we're really grading their performance. So they grade out as an A, as a B or a C and a couple other grades in between. And that helps us know exactly where they are. That actually helps the leadership team as well grapple with rationally the problems that we may be having with a person or a team. So it's funny, it's not just the individual grades that actually create the change in organization. It's seeing the grade of where that person is that creates the inertia and the momentum to be able to make change positively. Um, and sometimes, you know, either through coaching that person or, you know, unfortunately, sometimes through subtraction um, that has to take place, but we get a plan in place immediately for each person in the organization. And, you know, yes, this gets a little bit challenging as you get, as you grow in scale, you know, beyond 50 employees or hundred employees gets a little bit challenging. But what we find is that if we can teach our hiring managers how to grade in the same way as the leadership team starts with usually the first one or two levels out from the organization, we can teach everybody else to grade in that same way beyond. What we find is that we get a very consistent standard of understanding where people are, uh, one, where they're doing well and two, where they need help. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons that people don't, you know, haven't started one-on-one -on -one coaching. They don't know where to help anybody. They don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. So consequently, you know, I, you'll hear me say that this is the best shake everyone gets in their life in terms of uh, uh, the amount of support they'll get in an organization. Um, one of the things that I see happen consistently is that leaders will, you know, it's, it's not that they're pinned in that box permanently. You might think that way. Once you see the grade, oh, that person's always going to be a B player. I see just the opposite effect. And it's actually a really cool effect to see happen, which is the leaders actively try in most situations to get that person to rise up out of where they are and into a better spot. And they do start coaching immediately. So it's probably the best shake that person ever, ha has, ha ever has had. And, you know, I can compare that to that sort of grading process compared to, let's, let's talk about a place like Golf Channel. And again, love my Golf Channel colleagues. But I, one of the things that I did very early on at Golf Channel, I did what I hope all A players do. Um, I was their first director of search engine optimization, walked in the door. And I said, what are my KPIs? And their answer was, I don't know. Got to make them up. Well, actually, I didn't say you got to make them up. I just made them up. I said, here they are. Here's what I'm going to measure. Here's what I'll be measured by. And um, I actually wanted that in place. And I wanted that in place because I didn't want, want to be judged arbitrarily. And most people in most businesses are judged arbitrarily in their performance and their behavior. It is completely arbitrary. One person's opinion over the other. Uh, it's it, and so it, 
Uh, consequently, on the other side of the business in Golf Channel, we were in the on -air, online division and the on-air division. You know, I've seen people in the marketing department lose their job because someone didn't like a logo they produced the, the, the previous week. And we were never going to be held to that subjective of a standard. So, so the question there is, you know, if, and you mentioned this is the be best shape people will ever get. You know, the, and this is all about fairness. I mean, people think, well, you know, you, you don't want to put, you know, you don't want to put numbers to people, but actually, that objectivity makes it fair. You know, and you also mentioned earlier on about you know the leveling up and what was the term? I think you used a term. Uh, Trying to try to remember what the term you used. You know, you level up the assessments over the business. You know, there's a self self leveling. Was it? Yeah, yeah. It, and uh, and using those those assessments, it means that you know it is an objective assessment. So uh, it, it, as you say, it is probably the best, the most fairest way of assessing people and teams. Yes, it is a norming process, right? Mm -hmm. It's a norming process where the leadership team norms around what it means to be an, an eight on a core value or a ten, and it's a fascinating thing to see happen. And it tends to be the most tense. We they know they're going to have the conversation. It's the most tense thing they've ever done walking in. It's the most cathartic thing they've ever done walking out. So they get into that discussion. They actually share their grades with each other. They walk through each person on their team and they walk through and get, give specific examples of why they gave this person this grade for each core value, why they gave them the productivity score that they did. And then they'll get feedback from other team members. And if that if that person that they're if the person on their team, you know, if others have worked with that person, which generally they have in most companies, they have some interaction with other people, there is feedback. And that feedback can be both affirming and it can also be somewhat surprising to the leader as well. Because it's not every time the leader knows exactly what's happening with that person mm -hmm. on their team. And it is helpful in, in the most helpful way possible to the leader and to that person on their team. And so what we do at the very end is we commit to a coaching action with that person, whether that be that we're going to coach them on core values, we're going to help them on productivity, or we're going to put them on a performance plan or terminate them. We are going to commit in that meeting to the next step. And that, you know, again, can be a daunting process, but here's what's really interesting. So what we have learned over the years, when I've, I, I, I've had my clients track this and they actually come back and they say, yep, almost 30% every time. Uh, every C player you hold on to is about a 30% drag on every single team. And what this tells us, by the way, is in most organizations, if most organizations have 25% A players, 50% Bs, and 25% Cs, you could effectively let go of 25% of the organization and overnight happiness and productivity would go up dramatically. Yeah, I've seen that too. We, and, and usually, you know, and this is not, it's, it's, it, this is the fault of just not knowing any better in how we hire. Hiring is something we have to do. It's not a process or a system or something that is teachable, repeatable, valuable, right? It is something that we have to do and we show up. Sometimes we show up with our own standards, our own behaviors, our own ways to hire. It is not a company-wide system of qualification and disqualification. And that's how you win, is you put in place exactly that with top grading. So how, how do we change the sort of the entrenched belief that you have to tolerate C players? No, because you, you as coaches we walk into organisations and often one of the battles we have with the CEO is, you know, is well, well first of all we're convincing them it takes five to seven times before their team is going to start to understand what they're telling them, uh, but secondly that they need to start assessing, you know, doing a, an assessment of their leadership team and then each leadership team member needs to assess their team, so that you can identify the people who are not A players. And then put plans in place to deal with them, whether it's coaching or uh, you know development or, or or exit, you know, allowing them to find their freedom with with other companies. But there's a really entrenched belief in businesses that well, you know, you can't all be A players, and, and no, you can't all be A players, but you don't necessarily want 30, 40, 50 percent of C players. How, how do you go about changing that belief in in you know that's pretty f firmly held? So number one, the process of going through and evaluating your team and the method that I just described so that it's highly visual. And we do it in software so that we can see where someone is graded. We actually grade them on core values and we grade them on productivity so we can see it. Number one, that process in and of itself create, takes it from an irrational thought process to a rational thought process. There is an actual discussion that takes place about the true impact that person is having and how valuable they really are to the organization. That is usually one of the first steps is rational acceptance. The CEO and the leadership team collectively need to have rational acceptance of this. The second thing we do is try to get them past the idea that hiring is a cost and not a revenue and profit generating center, which it is if we use top grading. 
top grading can get us to 90% effectiveness. And there's a couple of keys in there that I'll tell you about that, I, that I, I've that i seen get most of my clients there. There's a couple that have struggled, but they haven't followed the process as thoroughly as they needed to. And once they do, they can get on point with that 90%. There's a couple of things that Compass did back in the day that I gave them credit for, for why this works so well for people. But um, once we kind of get one or two A players in the door, that is another key for the CEO to become hungry for the A player. That's one of the reasons I install top grading so early. Usually by month two, we're installing top grading because we're not going to let one more person come into the organization without going through a structured interview process. And they get that first A player in. I've seen to a person, every CEO become hungry for more A talent when they can see how that A player produces. And we're going to hit that right nine out of 10 times with that first person. So we absolutely want to be able for them to see visual evidence. They can sort of they have a couple of A players usually be able to see some evidence, but then you bring in another one that's another A player, and suddenly you start to change the definition of what's possible. Third thing is for CEOs to understand that person, the impact it's having on their team. So it kind of goes back to the first concept. But when you really dive into you know a lot of fear and concern, it's hey, if we let this person go, something is going to happen, or some kind of institutional knowledge will be lost. Uh, usually in the case of the C player, it's it's not that you're losing institutional knowledge. It's the longer you hang on to them, the bigger danger they pose to the A players. And number two, they actually are usually an institutional knowledge drain. And when you find you let go of a C player, all the stuff comes out of the woodwork. So usually what we have to try to do is convince them to at least let go of their lowest performing C players as quickly as possible. Um, Dave Bainey, who's a coach that we all know, had a famous line. I can't remember if it's in Dave's book or if he just said it to me outright. But you know, it, when after you identify C players, and I say this, and you, it, wh- wh- when we go through the process of evaluating a team, and we have a group of C players in front of us, I'll say, "Great, what time are they leaving today?" And I say that with absolute seriousness. And you see, the only reason I smile behind that, and I, I, I want to qualify this because it's people's livelihood, and I take it very seriously. But I will say that. It is what I am very excited for is the team that is left. And that's what we want to be truly excited about is the team and how their lives will change once we get rid of the C players that are dragging down the organization. And we are better off helping them find another role. We want to let them go consistent with our core values 100%. But we want to be able to get uh, that A player team to be able to survive and thrive uh, after the C players leave. And there's no better time than that day than to move them out. Yeah, I've, I've certainly observed, you know, go, when you're going through this process and, and it's the first time they've actually made definite plans to sort of move people on because they're not aligned to core values, they're not performing, so they're definitely C players. And almost that sort of, everyone's holding their breath as they leave and morale goes up, productivity goes up, things happen faster, you know, there's less missed messages, there's less miscommunication, and there's almost this, ah. <sighs> This, re- this sigh of relief as nothing went wrong, nothing broke, nothing fell to pieces, and everything's just lifted up. Everything's just lifted up. And I'm so confident in that now. Um, well, so a couple things happened. One, I'm so confident in that because I've seen it so many times. We've held on to somebody too long and we let them go and nothing happened. Actually, the opposite happened. Productivity went up. Um, I'm Not only am I confident in telling them that, one of the things that I do as a coach is I connect my clients to each other. So if they don't believe me, uh, they can call another CEO and get their perspective on exactly what happened. And all of them are happy to share that knowledge with each other. So I find that that's an easy way to get somebody over the hump if they're very, very hesitant to or, hesit- or reticent to move on from poor talent and poor behavior. I, I, ra- I just finished a, um, an annual planning session with a client yesterday. So I've uh, been working with this company for about a year. Uh, and th- they don't use top grading, but they use what they call strategic hiring, which you know, brings in certain, you know, many of the, the same concepts. And it's interesting how the leadership team has completely changed apart from two people. Uh, and they've now got a, an A-player leadership team, and they're starting to push down through the organization. Uh, and every now and again, they sort of, you know, they, they get rumors of, you know, dissent and mutiny in the ranks. Uh, but that's coming from the C players and they're self-selecting out. Right. You know, right. so their team is actually contracting, but they're actually performing better. Performing better. Uh, their productivity is going up, morale is going up. Uh, and it's the C players who are self-selecting out because, oh, suddenly it's not this, you know, they're not being tolerated anymore. They're being, they're being pressured. They're being assessed and they don't like it. Well, and this is what should excite people the most when they hear this is that we haven't talked much about the results yet, but the results I see from this are staggering and staggering in favor of using a system like top grading, going to one equals three hiring, subtracting all your C players. You'll, you'll usually uh, end up at about, you know, if you're with me three years later, you might end up being the same size of organization, but doing eight X the profit 
All right. So uh, one of my clients, I'll give you an example. One of my clients, we have a, a decent sized manufacturing operation. And let's say in their back shop in the manufacturing division, they had 25 people. And one day I remember talking to the head of the, 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 uh, the shop manager and said, hey, what if you, how many people do you have back there? He goes, 25. And I said, what if they were all like your A player, so-and-so over there? How many would you need? He said, 12. Process that for a second, right? Half, half. If people, if, if they were all like this one A player. So and what's really fascinating is over the course of the next couple of years, our profit went up 8,000%, literally. Like they were at negative profit to like positive 800,000 right? Um, and, and, and are shocked by this. And it's funny, they're part of a five division company and the other divisions are shocked. Like what has happened over here? And it's honestly because we have, uh, I mean, there are several things that play into the Rockefeller habits and everything else, but uh, look, 51% of that is getting the right person in the right seat. And all they did was they upped the rate for this position to get the A player. We managed to use uh, a, a version of, of top grading for this we actually had to scale it down a little bit to ideal team player, which wasn't quite as predictive, but it's predictive enough. And, um, you know, allowed us to double that A player percentage in a very short period of time. And we just grew like wildfire. This same scenario plays itself out again and again and again. And as a matter of fact, I cannot see any scenario where this doesn't work. Yeah, no one ever said we should have held on to that C player longer. Ever. No, no you've heard me say that a lot. No, mm -hmm. no. And in seven and a half years, I've never heard that. I've still never heard that to this day that we should have held on to that person longer. Not one time. Yeah, so, so we've, we've talked around the topic of, you know, top grading and A players. Do, do you use scorecards in your process? I do. I use scorecards. So scorecard for me and for, for my companies, we use it religiously in the top grading interview process. We are consistently testing against uh, the competencies required from the role, the outcomes for the role, the mission for the role. We're testing against that through every step of the interview process. And then for an existing employee, we do use it as a way to help someone uh, be able to grow themse to themselves for the next level. So particularly what we use are competencies. So, you know, we use the talent evaluation to know where someone is. Um, once a quarter, we'll pull out the scorecard, we'll review where they are relative to the scorecard, and we'll take a look at what specific competencies they need to improve upon. Now, keep in mind, we're coaching them on core values in our weekly meetings. We probably have a pretty good idea of where they're strong and weak on a lot of competencies anyway, but we'll have them pick one in particular they want to focus on. And then they have a personal growth plan for the next quarter that focuses on adding one thing um, to their own personal improvement over the, over the next quarter that will help them grow in that competency. And that's either to, either to get better in the role they're currently in or, the, or to prepare them for the next role in the organization. And we find that to be the best use of the scorecard. It's really a layer under the, the talent assessment or the talent evaluation process. And, and do you have a process for determining the right competencies for an individual? Is Because you know, there's lots of different competency models. You know, how, what, what do you use? FYI, for those that are top grading users, uh, if you ever want to read a book about top grading, you could read Who or Foolproof Hiring. And one of the things that we'll do is we will break the competencies down into four categories. Um, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Jed, for sharing that. Um, I'm we break the, other the one. competencies. No, I don't I gotta get I gotta get a copy of that too. But we break them down into four categories. And it's the competencies required to excel with priorities, competencies that are required to coach people, competencies that are required to excel with internal and external relationships, and competencies, uh, technical competencies that are required for the role. And once we break them into those four categories, we find that it's fairly straightforward to identify, you know, the top, you know, eight to fifteen competencies that are required for a role. So, and we try to, you know, get, get over 15 and you're looking for the perfect candidate, uh, which is a little bit challenging. You get too few and sometimes you don't see enough of the trade-offs. So we try to get into that sweet spot, particularly with our, our uh, more senior roles where you get about 12 to 15 competencies. But those, that's the, the method of doing that is to really say, hey, what are the most critical for the brain power needed to excel in priorities in this role, priorities in time management in this role? the uh, capability to be able to coach and lead, the capability to be able to have good internal external relationships using our core values. Uh, by the way, that's a cheat in column three. It's you actually base some of them off your core values uh, as many as you can. That's a, a great way to test for core values in the hiring process. And then in column four, it's do you have the technical competencies that are required to be successful in this role? But what you find really interestingly enough is that most roles, the technical competency column is the one that has the least competencies required. It's really most of the other categories that we need to be able to be successful in that role. So it tells you how behavioral work actually is and not just a strict skill output on a day-to-day -day basis. It's how I behave, how I treat others, um, what kind of habits and routines I have, 
those things are all covered in the first three columns. So if you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And if there is a bell, then please ring that bell. You'll then be notified of the next episodes as they come out. One of the things I see as I as I build out scorecards with my clients is, is when, when you ask someone to, to come up with their own draft scorecard, you know, they often come back and they're so close to what they do every day, they really struggle to come up with their accountabilities. You know, they, it's, all, it's almost like they, they can't put a mirror to what they do and capture that. Uh, so th- this is something I see time and time again. How do you deal with that sort of challenge? If you come across that challenge, I don't know. Well, so one of the things that we do, if you, if you get into kind of the metronomics framework, right, is that one of the things we do is, especially in our kickoff, is we get that KFFM, that key function flow map in place. And that starts to give us the top level uh, leading and lagging KPIs for each function in the organization. And that tends to be a very good starting point for the job scorecard. So, for instance, one of the things I'll do is I'll the leaders create their job scorecards first. And again, they don't do it in a vacuum. They're going to have to share it with each other and get feedback. But um, we try to make sure that, you know, the mission of this role is to drive the most important KPI they own, usually the output um, on their box on the key function flow map, to this point in a two-year period. And what I so let me say that again. It's the, the mission of this role is to drive this KPI from X to Y two years out. That's really how we start with a good mission for the role. And then that actually starts to feed the set of accountabilities and outcomes. So your first accountability just drops right down from the mission. It's really your first KPI that you have to hit. And then from there, you probably have your second KPI already identified in the key function flow map, which you know might be, and again, I know they're outcomes, but you might have a good leading indicator in there as well. And from those two, those two indices, you can usually find a third KPI that's another outcome for that role really, really quickly in that process. So that's what I found to be the easiest to start with the KFFM, uh, move into the mission and then tie it into the first accountability, add the leading indicator and maybe one other. And if you have three KPIs to measure and judge a role, you're usually in great shape. So you'll, you'll uh, use that term from, from X to Y by Z, you know, so it's actually yep. quantifiable. We start here, we want to end there by this particular date, whether it's one date. year, two years, three years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why I try to stay away from tasks in the job scorecard. It's not a task. It's a number that you own to be really, really straightforward about it to outcomes. And I see a lot of people get screwed up by just putting tasks in. That's not what it is. It's really the outcome you're trying to achieve. Um, one other metric that my, my leaders tend to have. So one of the things we keep track of is a player percentage. And again, you've heard me talk about a players a lot today, but a player percentage is the, next to profit and cash in the bank. There's nothing more important than the a player percentage of the organization. And we want each of our leaders to know what the A player percentage of their team is. We want the CEO to know what the A player percentage of the leadership team in the entire company is. Um, and we want them to all be actively driving toward improving that goal. So usually a fourth KPI that shows up for my team members is A player percentage. And, you know, we're not, it doesn't matter where it comes out on that first evaluation. We're going to put a goal in place with the CEO to be able to grow our team from here to here, from X to Y, right, over the course of the next year, over the course of the next four, course of the next four quarters. And what that allows us to do is really put in place everything we need to. So all the systems, the tools, the processes that we put in place that transform organizations, it's made so much easier and on everyone by having the right people in the right seats, and by having those A players. So actively putting a focus on getting that those A players in the right seats over the next year is critically important. A lot of my clients, you know, we talk about our HAGs a lot, our one, our BHAG, our three hag, our two hag, and our one hag, and our B hags are big, hair audacious goal. Our three hags are three year highly achievable goal. We have a lot of times we have a one hag and a Q hag, one year highly achievable goal. For a lot of my clients, their one hag is just to double the A player percentage. Because if we do that in year one, if we're 25 and we get to 50, we can do whatever we want in year two and year three. We can build whatever strategy we need to if we're trending towards, you, know, you start trending up towards 60% A players. And you're really starting to take off at that point. All the chaos is going on the way in the organization, the dumb, the stupid things that happen, that is getting eviscerated uh, as we add more and more A players to the team. That was an insight you gave me. And we, you know, when you ran that session in, in Whistler a few a few months back, you know, you were you were talking about you know pushing that A player percentage down in uh, be, below the leadership team. Now that's something I've always you know insisted on in in the leadership teams that I work with, but I'm not not sure why I missed that trick. Okay, having done it there push it down to the next level. So each of the leaders, the CEO's direct reports, they also have that as a KPI in their scorecard. So what is the percentage of A players in your team? And then cascading that down. And that that puts the accountability for having the right people 
into the right levels in the organization. That's very, very powerful. Well, let's talk about what kind of reinforcement that has. So going back to what we started talking about today, the reinforcement that that has is number one, that puts a bigger premium on the hiring process, right? Because we're going to absolutely make sure we get the A players in the door. For each of those managers, they're probably actively involved in in portions of that or a lot of that process. So um, it becomes even more tangible at that point to get the right person in the right seat. It becomes their top priority, which we need them to be able to, if you're going to make hiring work, you have to make it, you know, it can't fall usually lower than priority two and a quarter. Usually it's priority one if you're going to hire effectively, especially with top grading because that just solves everything else. Um, and then beyond that, it actually creates, it, it creates the momentum to keep doing the talent evaluation process as well because, and coaching, because as people coach consistently, they want to go back to the talent evaluation and see how their how their coaching has paid off. Are other people seeing the same improvements? Are they seeing this person is rising in their core value scores? Is their productivity as an, object, as an objective outcome? Is that increasing simultaneously? Those become very powerful reinforcements. Uh, you know, once I click that A player percentage goal in place, and team members know that is usually the most important thing that we focus on that gets us um, out of chaos. This could sound onerous. This could sound like a lot of work. So what would you say to a CEO or a leadership team member who who thinks that this is going to add to their workload? What would you say to them? Well, you know, what's interesting is, particularly early on, what I find is there's so much wasted time um, because you have a percentage of people, and even though they might have any potential in the organization, they still don't know when they take a task, my first job is to automate, eliminate, delegate that task. And what we can usually do is free up about a day of someone's time really early on in the process. And through that day, the expectation is they're going to replace it with hiring, coaching, and evaluation. And what that's going to do, it's going to transform their lives. And true, it may not be an immediate impact, right? It may, I mean, meaning that, you know, you might not get out of of having to deal with more work in month one or month two or month three. But by the time you get out of the backside of that, once you start getting to the second half of that, you know, month four, five, six, seven, eight, there starts to be a very tangible freeing up of time from that leader on that team because we've spent the right time on the right things. Finally, one of the first things I ask leadership team members is what's the biggest reason we haven't been coaching early on when I meet with them and they say, inevitably, I don't have time to coach. And we as coaches have to help them change that perception, which is no, 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 no. You have no time because you will not coach. So being able to coach team members actively does free up our time. And, you know, that's why I said there's usually a pretty quick improvement. I mean, three months is not that long. A quarter is not that long. I do see pretty regular improvements in time savings with leaders once they start actively coaching. And yes, our B players are not going to respond to coaching as well as our A players will. But even if we can coach the Bs, and if we've done the job of getting rid of the Cs, we'll start to see movement on the B player front. And that will tend to actively free up that leader's time. So you have no time, you you know, if we, some people will say, well, I have no time to do this. Um, when I hear that, I really hear, I'm afraid to form new habits. I'm afraid to form routines. Um, I'm afraid of change. And those things are not going to help us be successful as leaders. And the fact of the matter is we need you focused on that. That's, if you're going to lead, if you, have, if you have manager in your title or anything that remotely tells us that you coach or lead people, uh, you have to spend the time coaching, evaluating, hiring people. You have to. That's no excuse for it. Those are the most critical things that we need you to do in the role. And one of the key things, the key ways we can make a difference as a coach when we start working with a new organization is helping those leaders climb out of the weeds, you know, help them get out of the weeds uh, at, so that they can gradually reduce the noise in the business and start coaching their team. And then those results compound. Those, those results start accumulating and they start to see the difference uh, and then they, they get it. Then they get it. Once they can see the evidence, they get it. They do. They get it. And that's why early on, like I said, we're we're in a, we, I do a top five time wasters exercise. Write them down. Tell me how much time you take. If you could automate, eliminate or delegate a piece of it or simplify it, how much would it be and how much time would that give you back immediately? And like I said, that in and of itself is regularly eight hours back for most people. Um, they, they, you know, most people are, they're not at the point yet where they have thought, thought through systematically or use systems thinking to be able to go, could I automate it? Could I eliminate it? Could I delegate it? In a lot of cases, they're scared to hand off because they've just had so much poor poor experience with talent around them that they don't know who to hand it off to. But they can, in a lot of cases, even if delegation isn't an option, you can automate or simplify um, or eliminate. Uh, Interesting side note to this, uh, I had a, several years ago, I had a COO and I asked him that, what are the top five things that waste your time? And 
he threw me back a post-it note. He wrote down a post-it note, what the five things were, threw it across the table. And I said, how long did these things take out of any given week? And he said, that's half my week. By the way, this is a very small company. There were 12 people in there. And I said, okay, how many of these could be delegated? Guess what he said? All of them. All of them. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, there had to be some, some time management and prioritization work done there. But point being is a lot of cases, it's just because no one's asked. And that's where you have to get people's mindset is this is the stuff that we really need you to do. Uh, the other stuff where you're acting as a player coach uh, is helpful, but we need to get you out of the weeds. You need to be able to systematize enough of your work where we can get you focused on the three tasks of hiring, coaching, and evaluation, because that's where the biggest impact will come in your role. And most of the time, it's it's the inability to actually delegate those tasks down because you haven't coached and you haven't trained and you haven't developed that next level of leader so that you can delegate down. Uh, and you know, I know that you're, you know, we, we're both fans of the EOS system and in various tools in it. Now, I love their notion of LMA, you know, leading management accountability. Now, that is the number one thing in their, you know, in their, in their system, you know, if you're not leading, if you're not managing, if you're not holding people to account as one of your key priorities, what are you doing? You're probably doing someone else's job. Yeah, hundred percent. You're doing someone else's job and probably not the job that we, that we are requiring you to do in your role. Right. And that's what's, that is what is helping. That's what's um, preventing us from being successful. So you're actually abdicating your role and taking on someone else's. Don't know why people do that. Well, you know, and it's fascinating. You have a lot of well-meaning entrepreneurs and, uh, sort of uh, not even habits, but just expectations get formed in weird ways as organizations grow in scale. And so what a leader has to do versus what they actually do can sometimes be very, very different and out of whack. Um, the CEO sometimes doesn't even know what that leader should do and might be tasking their team members with things that in no way, shape or form should be the responsibility of the leader on that team. So it is an education process to be able to think through what are the most critical items to be able to be successful at. One of our colleagues, Carl Saunders, uh, you know, a couple of months ago said how critical one-on-one coaching was his organization. And one of the things that he really looks back and wishes he would have started sooner. And we do see that the earlier we can get people into the idea of, you know, not just one-on-one coaching, but of the evaluation process and of hiring, the faster they're going to be successful. It lets everything else occur from that point on. But uh, the one-on-one, just to be clear, that's the glue that can hold so much together. So we want to make sure that we are really, really sticking to that good one-on-one weekly one-on-one coaching session. Okay, Rob, that was that was awesome. This was a complex topic. It's complex because it involves people and uh, there's some very emotive topics that, you know, subjects that come out here. You know, we don't like letting people go, but sometimes it just has to happen because that's for the best interest of both the organization and the individual. Now, ultimately, if someone is not happy somewhere, they're better off finding their future somewhere else. So we always do that respectfully and we always do that with um, with empathy and kindness, but it often has to happen. But it also means that other people get the opportunity to really stand up and you know show their, show their light, show what they're capable of, because there's now capacity in your organization to coach and to lead and to manage and to do great things. What, what would you say are the characteristics of, of great organizations? You, know, you you've you know you've often mentioned about you know you see the same things in in teams that create great outcomes. What would you say those are? So a couple, couple of things. Number one, we have a hundred percent A player leadership team that is steeped in the five dysfunctions paradigm, meaning they can have great they have great trust and can have great conflict to get to great decisions. That's number one. Uh, number two, they have learned how to not tolerate. They've learned how to um, not tolerate poor performance. B players and C players are actively moving toward that A player model. Uh, Number three, they're following a simple execution rhythm. I have priorities. We have KPIs that can measure those priorities. And we have a consistent meeting rhythm that keeps us aligned and communicating well. Um, Number four, they have a rational trade-off in their business model between between price, quality, and speed. They know that they're going to be great at one in the mind of the consumer. They're going to use one of those variables to get to that number one output. And they're going to be intentionally bad or at least uh, not great at the third variable. And then number four, they have a business model that's built to go deep before it's built to go broad, meaning they they have a business model that's set up to hit a couple of key goals uh, with w- the one or two things they're best in the world at doing before they go out and tack on stuff to that. And if you can do all five of those things consistently, you're going to be a very successful organization. But that really leads back to, you know, it comes back to the discipline of one person, and that is the CEO. 
And if the CEO is disciplined to be able to make those, to, to be able to insist that the leadership team be disciplined as well, we'll have a very significant, we'll have a very, very successful organization. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. That was a, that was a great conversation. This is, this is a topic that's getting a lot of focus at the moment. So good to be able to do a deep dive into, into that. Now you mentioned a few tools uh, as we went through the topic. Are, are these tools that you make available or are they your proprietary tools? Um, so one of the tools that, uh, as we talked about top grading, one of the tools that, uh, one is my proprietary tool, tool called Grover Talent. And you can find that at G-R-O-V-E-R talent.com, Grover Talent. And that helps you to be able to grade your organization against, you know, set your core values, grade your organization against core values and productivity goals. And that's where you can grade and measure the progress of teams and individuals over time. And there really isn't systems that do that consistently where the short, where the, the scores can be looked at among a group of leaders and aligned upon. There really wasn't anything like that. So I had to build a tool that solved my own problem. So yes, Grover Talent is out there and you can go set up a free account on Grover to check it out. Well, we'll bring this session to a close. Uh, always great chatting to you and uh, always great, always find our conversations absolutely fascinating. Same, same. Thank you, Jed. I love being able to talk about the best practices and the ways that we help organizations. It's a lot of fun to be able to see people and companies grow and change. So thank you. Uh, absolute pleasure. And maybe we should bring you back and uh, we can sort of you know, drill down into maybe one of those topics in, in even more detail. I look forward to that. Love to. Love to. Have, happy to come back. We'll, get, we'll, we'll cover more fun stuff. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this 20 plus year old proven system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else that great podcasts are found.